Fabulous flowers, luscious lawns, verdant veggie plots and backyards. What does your garden say about you? If it's crying out for an overhaul or you simply need help to get started, then we're here to inspire you. Let's, let's go. <laughs> oh, that's me. Oh, OK. I'm Chris Beardshaw, passionate horticulturalist and professional landscape architect. I propagated my first seeds when I was four and haven't looked back since. Pretty by hand. Yeah. One more chomp here. No, no, whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm Colin Donaldson, builder and landscape gardener. For me, it's always been about the property and the landscape working together. And if there's heavy machinery involved, then all the better. There's the instruction. <laughs> <laughs> We're on a mission to help six families transform their gardens. So let's get up and grow. Later in the programme, we're in Ballycarry, where we'll be introducing herbaceous meadows to the front garden of Wendy and Sophie Carson. First, we've got Paul Malone in Mollusk, who's got a fabulous rural location that's just crying out for the perfect wildlife haven. Well, this is going to require precision and a very delicate touch. Definitely. Paul Malone runs a graphic design business in Belfast. Several years ago, he moved into an old converted church in Mollusk on an acre and a half side of land. Always lived in the city up until about four years ago. Then I decided to move here because uh, I really liked the idea of having a bit of space, a bit of greenery, a bit of tranquility. Supposedly, this is my garden. It's more of a field. It has no structure. Every time I come down, it's like, it's just a field. And what's hilarious is during the winter, you can see a walked path that's just round the outskirts where I walk the dog. I'm not maximising this because there's just vast areas that I probably don't even set food in. So far, I've been reading the internet and trying to figure out what to do to varying degrees of success. Some of them have been quite good, some of them have been utter disasters. You know, I put in a polytunnel um, to try and grow my own veg. It didn't really work well last year. I got lots of wee, small, crispy plants. Obviously, I found out you shouldn't plant seedlings in mid-July. I would love this to be the garden of my dreams. Uh, some structure to it, you know, have delegated areas, areas that I can just go and sit, you know, and relax, you know, even with my laptop and do bits of work. I've always thought of a garden should be like an extra room in the house. I would be quite passionate about keeping it as native as possible. I'm not the sort of person that would want fake palm trees or Japanese gardens or lots of gravelly areas. I would love a garden of adventure, you know, where there's lots of nooks and crannies and tucked away hidden areas. Um, that excites me. Gardening actually excites me because it's a hundred miles removed from what I do as a day job. As Paul wants his garden to be a haven for wildlife, there's only one place to start by introducing him to the delights of wildlife ponds. One of the nice things about your site, Paul, is that it, it, it is a natural habitat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got a very informal feel to it, and a wildlife pond is gonna be the perfect addition to this space. I mean, mm -hmm. the pond is, if you think of it as the engine of a garden, and the mm -hmm. other thing is it's about the habitats, and you've got the trees, the scrubs, the grassland, mm -hmm. They'll all be in there. The problem at the minute is it's all in the outskirts and it's trying to get it from the outskirts and far away actually into my garden. Exactly. Everything's teetering, waiting to come in, but we have to invite it and we'll do that yeah. with the pond. And also okay. don't forget that the, the pond isn't just attracting wildlife, it's also a great attractor for gardeners. Yeah. Gardeners love sitting around the pond, wonderful reflections and so watching animation. And so I think that, you know, if, if the sun sets over there and rises over there, that mm -hmm. should be a principal orientation. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we just spray some things out, get your streamer out, 
See yeah, how and if you put that. it there, then whenever the sun sets, the sun will just light the surface. Perfect. He's thinking mm. artistically, you see. He's thinking with a gin and tonic see? in his hand. <laughs> That's why I'm a designer. <laughs> I could learn something from that. A pond is undoubtedly the most important element that you can put into a garden. They attract all sorts of creatures because it's, it's a breeding ground, of course it's a, a, a drinking resource, it's a feeding resource. It, it is like the kind of service station of the, of the garden and it's, it's absolutely critical that we provide as many different mm. habitat opportunities. Well, this is, a, this is actual size. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Right, this is, this is your existing mound remodeled over there. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's our new mound, which is excavated soil, and then the um, water will be in there, in a sort of tear shape. And the idea is yep. that that's the high end of the mound, mm -hmm. falling to a low, low end rising to a high, mm. and that means that um, what we're going to do is to line it up so you're going to lie on that piece of mound, looking due west through that gap. Lovely. That's actually really nice. Actually. That's what we're up to. It's so much more than just a round pond, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> So we need to mark out the boundary of the pond and strim the area we're going to be digging out. It's important to check the ground for wildlife before strimming. We also need to make sure it's level. Two down. Ponds can be the devil or the greatest thing you ever did. They can look Awful if you don't get the levels right and get them to blend them with the ground, or they can look fantastic. How many do you think it is? Four. It is full. I know. Oh. <laughs> you, <laughs> glass eye. A centimetre hit again. One and a half. And once it's level, it's my favourite bit. Bring in the big guns. I'm going to resist the temptation to talk here about boys and toys. I don't know if Declan can see that line, or is it just luck? <laughs> it's too, too many times in a room for it to be luck. <laughs> Obviously we're creating a, it's actually an artificial environment. Yeah. We're trying to get it as close to the real thing as possible. But you get a, you know, the right balance of plant life and, and wildlife will mm. develop and, and it should work as a little ecosystem. Mm. Nice waders, Chris. My bum little big in these. No, it's like two boiled eggs and a hanky. But you do know that the stream that Paul's taking you to is as deep as my paddling pool. Did your mum never tell you to take precautions with rubber? Your local stream is a perfect demonstration of why we're going to so much trouble in the garden, mm -hmm. to create those graded banks, the soil banks down into the water. Mm -hmm. Compare where you're sitting at the moment, which is virtually devoid of any meaningful vegetation, mm -hmm. with that side. And what you see is that not only can plants not get on mm -hmm. that piece, but more importantly, in a wildlife pond, you can't get any animals in. Even the voles, the hedgehogs, the frogs, the toads, they can't get in and out on that wall. And yet, if you provide a nice, steady beach like this, mm -hmm. they can access the water, they'll engage with it, and then they'll leave. And this is the route to really enlivening the wildlife pond. A good, steady beach. Curiously, it's not just the fauna that have problems getting into the water. It's also the plants. We have to provide a series of stages to mm -hmm. keep them happy. And just take a look at this example, where the wall, which is completely devoid of all planting, mm -hmm. has suddenly crumbled. The plants have leapt at the opportunity to really engage with the water. Now, plants like different levels of engagement. So some like to have their roots out of the water, mm -hmm. some like to have their toes just in the water, and some throw caution to the wind and just leap straight in and like actually reveling in the deep water. And here you've got some great examples. There's a little fern here, meadow sweet, the celandine in flower, mm -hmm. showing the different stages that the plants wish to experience. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we repeat those stages in your pool. All that wax and lyrical is well and good, Chris, but we've still got a pond to dig. It's actually getting quite exciting now that I can start to see it in shape. Whenever I talked to Chris and we were sketching things out in the grass, 
you have no idea of scale, size, anything like this. It's only now, whenever there's big holes dug in the ground and pegs marked out, it, it, you can see where, what shape it will be and you can see directions and you can see how it's going to be. Can you make sure that that goes right down into the, into there? So when we're lining the pond, it's vital that the pond liner doesn't get damaged. That's why we're putting down two layers of felt, one below the liner and one above the liner. So here. Uh, come a bit of metre. The mine's exactly uh, worked out there. <laughs> You'll find you would have to adjust Except that. that. <laughs> That's the furthest corner. <laughs> right, okay. And while this is a reasonably big pond, the same rules apply to jobs on a smaller scale. So what you're saying is size doesn't matter. Except, of course, when it comes to your diggers. To top it all off, we're laying down subsoil taken from the bottom of the pond to provide plants with good rooting opportunities. Good river dance, Chris. More of a rain dance, actually. How else do you think we're going to fill it? Well, in answer to your question, the Glengormley Cadet Firefighters have done us a huge favour and agreed to fill Paul's pond as part of a training exercise. It would have taken us two days to fill the pond normally. Of course, it goes without saying that you'll get a very short reply if you call 999 to fill your pond. Try a more conventional and sedate approach. Just to see it being filled, isn't it? It's one of those very satisfying things that you do all the grunting and then sit back and watch it appear. That's the thing about water, isn't it? You just can't see stare at it like ball. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just you. <laughs> Does everybody not go ball? <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce you to your new pond guests. Okay. A whole suite of fantastic plants. Mm -hmm. Now I've arranged them okay. in a logical order. These are the shallow guys. Those, Those are, are the submariners. Okay. This is a stilby um, from Japan. Wonderful plant to stick in the sunshine. This is a real kind of sun lounger, mm -hmm. but it likes to just have the kind of sniff of the pool. Okay. Nothing more. And then do you recognise this fella? Well, if you had to hazard a guess, what is it? It looks like uh, rhubarb. You're absolutely right. It is a rhubarb. Is it? This is a rheum, um, but this is an ornamental rhubarb. Not edible. Don't try it to this one. <laughs> well, you can if you want, but... <laughs> uh, we grow this in, in a pond, again, just with its feet, just in the reach of the water, okay. but the crown well clear of the water. Beautiful, bold leaf. This is a baby leaf at the moment. By the time it, it's finished growing mm -hmm. in one season, the leaf will be about that big. Brilliant. So it'll be about three, mm. four feet across, and the stems become much more elegant. Mm. Coming into this batch, now we're into those guys <clears throat> who like to be in the water. Okay but they're not deep swimmers. They're not confident swimmers. These are guys that like to be quite near the edge or even just creeping out of the pool. There's one in here that's definitely worth having a sniff of. Grab that. Oh, there's a sort of minty smell it's, almost off it. It's water mint. It's water mint? It is water mint and it's good at casting shade. Okay. So again, it's gonna to help to protect the pond and keep the algae, the algae at bay. Brilliant. Then we've got um, the uh, iris. We grow it because of its upright leaves and the reflection of the upright leaves in the Ooh, horizontal of plane lines. of water is just delightful. And the same with the bulrushes. Okay. Now, submariners. These, <laughs> these are the least impressive when they're in a pot. You <laughs> have to go imagine. with me on this one. <laughs> these are the nymphias, okay. the water lilies. Mm -hmm. But you know, none of this mm -hmm. would be possible. All of these would be wasted. The pond would just be a stagnant pile mm -hmm. if it wasn't for that. <laughs> Possibly the most <laughs> impressive plant of the assured <laughs> This is Ceratophyllum, an oxygenator. Okay. You get these once the pond has cleared, which will take about a week for that okay. sediment to clear. Get your waders on and mm -hmm. drop these into the depths. You'll never see them again, but these are what breathe life, literally breathe life into the water. Okay. These are the oxygenators. Don't ignore them. <laughs> these okay. are the most important of all of your plants. <laughs> they feed everything else. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to try and get Paul to resist that temptation to plant 
today because the pond plants, those that are actually in the water, need clarity of water. They need the sun's rays to get through the water to hit their leaves. There's too much silt, the sun wouldn't get to the leaves, and as a consequence, the plants would die. So much better to let the pond settle for a week or so and then start to include the pond plants. <laughs> I think it's immense. Uh, I love the shape, I love the structure to it, I love the flowing lines. If it was me, I'd have dug a big hole in the ground and that would have probably been about the height of it. I think Paul will be amazed at the amount of wildlife that even this pond is able to, um, to bring into the garden. It's, it's a, a, a kind of a wonderful arena in which to, to witness so much activity. So if he sits on the embankment quietly, he will just experience a whole encyclopedia of activity. Next up, we're off to Ballycarry to the home of Wendy Carson and her daughter Sophie, who have a front garden in need of livening up. When I came here, um, there was three very specific areas um, in the garden. There was a front garden with a beautiful view across Scotland and then the side garden for the more sociable side, um, the seating area over there to the right, and the, the barbecue house. And then the back garden, which um, leads from my bedroom. Um, I put patio doors to bring the garden into the bedroom. And it's a very private garden. But the garden at the front, I think, is the first point of contact when you come to the house. And I think at the minute it's very lacking and it could do with certainly um, to be reinvented and to do the house justice. I think it needs to be more vibrant and appealing and more of a curb appeal so when people drive by, they don't just drive by, they drive by and say, that garden just looks fantastic. I have a lot of ideas and I sometimes you don't know whether in reality they will work but um, to have that expert advice and guidance in planning and creating a garden would be invaluable to me. You know, of all the projects we get involved with, I think front gardens are the most challenging. There's something unique about dealing with the range of issues. Yes, yeah, so this is very typical of a, a front garden in an area where all the houses were built at once. The builders left them all the same, and I don't think people know where to go with them, so year after year they stay, they stay like this. I mean, it's, there's no personality in this. There's nothing to reflect Wendy's sort of energy and vibrancy. And you look at this and you think, retirement home, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> very much so. <laughs> We need to really get a few shapes in here, get a bit of colour, liven the whole place up. It needs some energy, it needs some vibrancy, doesn't it? You tell her it looks like a retirement home. <laughs> i got to tell her you two said that. <laughs> I don't think Wendy's front garden really is very different to most people's front gardens. We don't spend a lot of time in them, we don't pay them a lot of attention, and so they just become kind of redundant spaces. It essentially sits as a buffer between the public zone and the private zone, and that's all we think of it as. Why don't you want to come home and see something which inspires you, which when you drive around the corner in Wendy's case, you think, I'm glad to be home. Now, Wendy, there are aspects of your front garden that Colin really, really likes. What were they again? Well, he actually said it looks like an old people's home. <laughs> no, no, that's not true, that's true. I was, I was cajoled <laughs> not into to being rude tales. about it. Okay. <laughs> we feel that there's an element of a sort of sombre tone about it. Mm -hmm. It needs lifting, it needs, it needs a bit of tender loving care, it needs embracing. How do you feel when you, when you look at it? It's, it's very plain. It's very sad. It it's does. not very bubbly. No, it's not very bubbly. No, you're not, you're not very it doesn't. Bubbly, it, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't reflect my personality. <laughs> okay. You've got a classic issue of a long, thin garden, and this side isn't talking to that side. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is to unite the two. And I think we need swathes of planting coming through. But I don't think it needs to be too formal. I don't know, I don't know how you feel about having it so that it's relatively spontaneous. It's a kind of spontaneous tapestry of planting. Yes, that sounds good. Yeah. Any idea what I was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you're just nodding. Like, yes, that sounds good. And then you're going to go behind and say to Kurt, what was he talking about? I don't know, but I feel the same, only slightly different. <laughs> when you're faced with a, a blank canvas, which is what Wendy's got at the moment, the thing to do is to, if you use any, any sort of vehicle, any mechanism, the hose pipe is perfect, you can use string, you can use spray, you can use sand, whatever. From up there, it's almost too, too flat here. I think we'll 
curl it back in here. You try and get some sort of movement in the garden and try and imagine how your eye is going to move through the space. What we then need to work out is the gravel coming off of there. And that's all that we're doing with the hose pipe, is to just allow the eye to drift along the border. So it's moving through in a sinuous manner that way. And then when your plants come in, your plants will be allowing the eye to do that through the border. So we're getting ripped into Wendy's garden with the help of a turf lifter, which makes life a little easier. And while hiring in the right machinery often helps, there's sometimes no substitute for brute strength. I'm just going to leave that there. There's a half. Break the curb out from there all the way around. Want to get the sledge? Have a sledge off? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> just minor windows, <laughs> won't you? Yeah, yeah. Stem birch. What do you call it? It's a multi stem birch. Yes. It was really revered in the Roman period and they used to harvest short stems, maybe a metre or so long, and then they'd spend all evening whipping each other with them. And that was. Oh, of an evening. <laughs> How the evenings flew by. <laughs> well, I just got a pipe with it. OK, I'll take your word for yeah. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But the idea is because it's got yes. because it's got more than one stem. Visually, yeah. it's much more imposing than a single stem tree. Yeah, we're trying to create the impression of a, a copse, so some plenty of trees, and, and a kind of generosity of canopy, and that's what the multi stems are, are so good at. But also, when you look at it, it's got quite a compact root ball, yes. so you get all of the flavour of a copse and, and multiple tree planting mm -hmm. with none of the invasion of the roots. And it's also a very fibrous root as well. So you don't get really strong structural roots pushing under foundations and services and blocking drains and that sort of thing. Okay. So actually the birch um, family are very good at, at um, being small garden trees. It's a, it's a really lovely tree. To introduce Wendy to the principles behind the planting in her garden, I'm keen to show how wild plants interact. This little square metre here is really the inspiration for what's going on in the front. If you get plants that are happy together and they produce a community which is a solid, robust community, it is by definition a very low maintenance garden. They're all jostling against one another mm -hmm. and they know each other's capabilities and personalities and no one suddenly starts to override everything else. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we see here. But you can divide the way that the plants work into three different categories. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there are things like the sow thistle here, yes. which is essentially a clump forming plant. Mm -hmm. It produces a great round of foliage, mm -hmm. it stays pretty static, mm -hmm. and it just kind of grows out the ground like that yes. in a great column. Yeah. That's the clump formers. Okay. The next strategy are the carpeters. These are plants which literally flow like a, a horticultural river through the borders. And these are things like the geranium, Robertianum here, and also the buttercup the creeping buttercup down here. And they move around the columns, they flow through the columns. And then you've got the light, breezy, sparkly little things, like little tiny explosions, which just impromptu happen all across the border. And that's really characterized by things like the hairy bittercress, which has explosive seeds. The seed pod goes pop and the seeds are just scattered randomly across the border. So you've got three completely different ways in which the plants colonise and defend their territory, if you like. Yes. What we're going to do is to use the same characteristics, the clump formers, the carpeters, and the explosives. And we're going to use the same strategy with the exotic herbaceous perennials. Mm -hmm. So it's a very informal, very fluid way of gardening. Sounds fabulous. By taking Wendy to see the difference a front garden can make, I'm hoping she can appreciate the value it can add to her home. OK, Wendy, we've just popped round the corner here to, sh to have a look at what I believe is a good example of a front garden. Now, you see there's a few houses for sale on the street, yeah. and this one stands out. A fair bit you're not selling your house at the moment, but it shows you underneath it when people are getting to the point they want to make their house look better. 
What do they do? They do something about the front. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really good. It sets off the, the front of the house. It's nice to see two surfaces meeting, your vertical and your horizontal, with a break of greenery. So you've got the backdrop of your house with the plants in front of it, and it just softens everything down. Yours are going to be a lot more herbaceous and grassy, and this is, you know, there's no right and wrong in it, but one thing you do want to make sure is that you're not creating a maintenance nightmare. It's not like a back garden where you can chop and change and try new things. You want this to set off your house as it says, and I believe that increases the value of the house. In fact, it's proven that it does. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great curb appeal now. That certainly would appeal to me, and I think it's, it looks, um, the, all the greenery does soften the front of the house, and it is appealing. Curb certainly. appeal, you're sounding like Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now that Colin has explained to Wendy the merits of a well-tended front patch, let's start planting. What we're trying to do is to, is to sort of capture the spirit of the meadow at the back, of the wildflowers at the back. Yes. And they don't, there's no logic to where they're placed in terms yeah. of straight lines and patterns. There's no rhyme or reason to heights or distances between plants. You just have to kind of go with the spirit of the plants and then just allow them to fill the spaces that they want. What about the maintenance of them? Well, they'll be so closely knit within a season or so. Yeah. There's no maintenance. You so just there's no room for weeds then? No room for weeds. Really no room for weeds? Well, if you see, if you see a weed, call Colin. OK. <laughs> you got that, Wendy? Mm -hmm. What did he say? <laughs> Sounds very good. <laughs> right. you, you've still got the weeding job. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Is that in the right place? I don't know. I'm just about to get toned off. <laughs> the prairie planting style that we're doing here is beautifully simple. Inspired by nature, capturing the spirit and the robust habits of plants and substituting the native species for exotics, those from foreign climes. So we're just relying on three basic building blocks, columns, carpets and explosions. Simple as that. When you come out of, of your conservatory, you're looking at this, you start to see the desk champs, your kind of golden feathery heads caught by the late evening sunshine. That'll drift your eye around through the underside of the birch tree, which is very light canopy, and then it'll go take you right across to Colin. So the trick is to get the eye to move through the garden. This isn't a garden of, of full stops. It's mm -hmm. not about stopping the eye. This is about allowing the eye to drift through. Mm -hmm. And it, if you allow the eye to move, the garden seems so much bigger. And that's just the start. We haven't even finished putting the clubs in yet. <laughs> This garden's particularly interesting because it's the most herbaceous plants I've ever put into such a small area. And I think it's going to be a huge flash of colour. And credit to Chris in that one, I wouldn't have been just so brave with it. I'd have mixed in the odd shrub just to keep the winter a bit uh, happier. You all right with that? Yeah. Sure? Yeah. Is that all right? Give me your hands. Look at this. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Wendy with dirty hands. How does that feel? I even broke a nail. You've connected with the garden. You broke a nail. Yeah. Send okay. us the bill. <laughs> I've just um, realised that getting out into the garden is so much fun and getting your hands dirty and breaking nails, you know, it's just, it's part of the fun and it's, and it's, it's, it's very um, infectious and I've really enjoyed being outside today and, um, you know, really I'll certainly look at the garden in a very different way from now on. I think we've discovered a gardener. I think we've discovered somebody who suddenly has realised what's special about getting your hands dirty. It's not difficult, it's not complicated, it makes people smile, it makes you feel good to be alive. <laughs>